Welcome everyone to the first of our six programs about the huge manatees or if you prefer the humanities. No, that's probably not the uh, worst joke or pun that is going to appear somewhere in this or the future five programs, but hopefully it's got you awake and it's a good starting point to think about the humanities in primary school. We're going to be focusing upon primary geography, but we are going to be linking it to history and to religious education or religious studies. So welcome. I am Dr. Roger Wood and I am a senior lecturer in education. Welcome to programme one. There you go, flawless. And welcome to programme one. Maybe not as flawless as I would have liked. Let's move on. OK, David Attenborough, I am not. Even though you look at those pictures and you might see a similarity. I have no idea. Bear with me, people. Stay with me. My research focuses upon primary science, nature conservation and inquiry based learning, including outdoor learning. I have quite a strong background in uh, the outdoor education field and science and conservation outside the classroom, not just in the classroom, but beyond. And my research continues to involve the scientific and the geographical side of things. And there's just a, a few of the things uh, that are there probably on my CV and some lovely photos of me throughout my teaching career and here we are this is how i look this morning as ever bright cheerful you might not be watching this this morning who knows but there you go there i am ready to take you through this next series of six programs about how you can engage children with geography and with the humanities this series of programmes combines history and geography and belief, belief about what the land used to be like, what the land used to offer and what was available to it. And although there's a focus within these programmes upon the national curriculum in England, it can equally apply to the curriculum for excellence in Scotland and also to the particular primary curriculums in Wales, Ireland uh, and further afield. This programme, series of programmes, they're not presented in any professional sense as you can probably tell by the quality of the commentary and also what it isn't here to do is tell uh, trainee teachers or even qualified teachers how to teach. There's a certain element of what to teach but there's a focus upon themes and those themes of time, of place, and of belief. So you've got all sorts of things there. So it really isn't about you need to teach this and this is how you teach it, but it's looking at themes, themes of outdoor learning, of inquiry based learning, of health, of well being, and what it means to be here and the stories that we can tell stories based maybe upon the sheep the kind of history that's happening like the sheilings that we've got here up in the central highlands but if you're wanting something to say well this is what you should be teaching and this is how you should be teaching it there are numerous websites out there that will help you so here we go on with the program welcome This series of programmes combines history and geography and belief, belief about what the land used to be like, what the land used to offer and what was available to it. And although there's a focus within these programmes upon the national curriculum in England,
As you can tell, and as I said earlier, it's not necessarily a professional commentary. I think one of the key things we have to think about when we're looking at geography is that there is geography without people. Clearly, you have to be there as a person to be able to see it, but very rarely can you remove the human element uh, when it look, comes to looking at geography. We have an influence upon the physical and the natural geography around us. So today we're going to think about what geography is and to a certain extent the influence of that first theme of uh, time. But what we need to look at is the fact that geography's core knowledge can be thought of as its vocabulary. And if you like, we have an extensive information uh, rich basis of this world subject. But it cannot be separated from history and other aspects of huma humanity uh, like our beliefs or if you our religion or our culture, they're all tied in together. And underpinning all of this, there's a strong sense of space or place and time. And when we talk about time, we're thinking about what it used to be like in the past, and we're looking for geographical clues. And again, that brings in history. But also we're thinking about what it can be like and should be like in the future. So within the national curriculum, it's all about curiosity. It's all about inquiry. It's not sitting in a classroom and filling in lots of worksheets or looking at maps and just deciphering the symbols without getting out and about and finding out more about the world and not only the nature and the wildlife and those fantastic landscapes, but also about their influence as well. well here we are up at the Ardverick Estate and Loch Lagan, and this really is the introduction to our series of six programmes where we'll be thinking about geography from the point of view of natural physical and human uh, geography, but we'll also be looking at it as the basis for outdoor learning for children, for inquiry-based learning, and an opportunity to enhance and really develop children's health and well-being by being out and about and being able to explore, to be able to tell stories about the area that they find themselves in. But it's also looking at the changes over time, this sense of place, the beliefs that people have about these places. And clearly it is about place, but it's about the landscape. It's about mapping, it's about mapping changes. And it's about helping children to get out here and really have a look. And this is such a fantastic location very famous location. It's been involved in a number of different television programmes and films, including, as I've mentioned before, Monarch of the Glen. This is Glen Bogle, and that up there is Ben Bogle. And also Salmon Fishing in the Yemen, Rob Roy. I gather also that at one stage it was also featured in Harry Potter and Braveheart. And again, these are all stories, and who knows? Talking of stories and thinking of the Loch Ness Monster, who knows what lives in a loch like this. Well, here we are.
I'm not sure quite why that keeps recording twice, but there, there you go. So looking at this, I, I've had the joy of being out and about preparing some of the filming uh, for this particular series of programmes. And one of the things you'll have gathered is that, as I say, you've just got to get out there and enjoy it in whatever the weather. This view is of one end of Loch Tay uh, over at Kenmore. Uh, but again, a glorious day when I was out there, but when I was at Ardveriki, where I was filming in the previous, uh, for the previous slide, uh, the, it was a particularly windy uh, day. But that doesn't stop you getting out and about with children and having a look at these places. We think about time, but we think about time in relation to places and what the place is about and why it is as it is. Has it always been like that? And I think the key thing here is that simply absorbing lists of geography's vocabulary doesn't amount to much more than a dramatic feat of memory, and which that can be incredibly impressive. But in itself for children, it, it, it's not a sign of the intellectual development that we could regard as geographical thinking. And really what we're looking for is a form of conceptual knowledge development where we can link together all this information and ideas that we have together with geographic thought. Because geography is a world subject. It tries to keep things whole. Geographical thinking includes relating the local and the global, the near and the far, the physical and the human people and their environments and how they change that environment, the economic and the social, time and distance, seasons, the weather, climate, and so on. So uh, clearly a whole load of things will come to mind when you think about the word geography. Part of that will be based on the quality of experience that you had uh, within your geography lessons within your school. But the key thing here is to think about contextual knowledge in relation to con conceptual knowledge. And all those things, con context, concepts, we combine them together in a sense of geographical inquiry. And it concerns specific place in the time that it is now, and how it has been, and we investigate it. Children get out and about, and they look at the environment around them, and the impact that they and others have had, and can have upon it in the future. And geography has a tremendous power, and I've deliberately included a whole series of photographs that I've taken uh, on, on my travels around Scotland uh, in order to, to prepare for these series of programmes. But ultimately, whilst we might go into schools and we might say that we look at abstract models with the children or we get them doing worksheets, worksheets or even worksheets about mapping and weather symbols and things like that, that presents it as a dull and lifeless subject. And what we need to do is get the children dressed in the appropriate clothing and get them outside, whether it's into the school grounds or into a local local patch. Because as with any other subject in the curriculum, we're, this is just one point in time in their learning. But we're wanting to enthuse them and engage them and help them to see the relevance of geography so that it's a subject that they don't just see as isolated but a, as part of what it means to be human and something that they want to carry on finding out about way beyond their time spent with you in the classroom. And this is why when you're looking through this power of geography, it's all about bringing in the children's lives and the children's experiences and using them. What do they know? What do they want to find out about? What are they learning 
and how are they learning it? So, as I say, it, it draws upon a vast range of vocabulary and it's about looking and inquiring. Now, we will have things that we would like the children to learn, that we would like them to know about. But ultimately, it's about getting the children to reflect and revisit their learning and actually revise their ideas because they may go out into the different environments that you have available to you with a particular set of ideas that, are, that they think are fairly fixed and with that they bring misconceptions but it's about getting them to have a look have a look again revisit it reflect upon it and revise your ideas and at that I mean as as children and these lead to high level thinking or high level ideas that can be applied across the humanities across the curriculum because you can bring maths and science and music and drama in to help identify a question to guide an investigation to organize information suggest explanations and assist decision making so once we found out about this particular area what do we want to do with that information what decisions can we make what actions uh, can we actually take and as i say it's more than than core knowledge it's looking at why places are changing over time how they're in how they're interconnected but it's dealing with the here and the now of real life. So it's enabling the children to start telling stories or even using already published stories to explore geography and landscape and thinking about their setting in those landscapes in terms of a sense of place and a sense of time. And it might develop from myths and legends, from fiction. I'm thinking of the Katie Moreg stories here. And it can lead to further myths, legends, and stories that help to really fix their understanding and help them to apply it to this idea of the here and now. And of course, we live in a world at the moment where there is a focus quite rightly and we need to defend and promote this most vehemently, this idea of climate and climate change and the importance of nature and conservation and understanding that the environment that we live in has an influence. It has an influence upon us, but equally we have an influence upon that environment. And one of the big uh, major issues and areas that we're talking about a lot uh, within education and and within life as a whole is this idea of our health and well-being whether that's mental health and well-being or physical health and well-being because they are interrelated psychologically philosophically uh, and physiologically and so getting the children out and about and getting them away from the classroom and helping them to see that learning is something that doesn't just take place in a classroom, but that the world, both local and global, is, is, is absolutely central. It's a, it's a huge classroom with huge opportunities. And this is why I'm not telling you, this is what you must teach and this is how you must teach it. Because there are so many websites so many resources that you can find on the internet. There's no point in me going through all of them. It's about these series of programs are about the key ideas, the central ideas that we can use to help engage children with understanding the world about them, but applying the knowledge and ideas that they gain to help them to make a difference to their environment in the future. And as Barack Obama said, and I am going to read this particular slide to you, the study of geography is about more than just memorizing places on a map. It's about understanding the complexity of our world, 
appreciating the diversity of cultures that exists across continents. And in the end, it's about using all that knowledge to help bridge divides and bring people together. So here we've got a, a fabulous picture and we can see all sorts of things here. And what we can particularly see is the combination of the three different types of geography that we tend to focus upon. The, the physical geography with the cliffs there and the natural geography in terms of the wildlife, the flora and the fauna that can be found there, the way water is essential to life. And you've got the physical side of things in terms of erosion as those cliffs are breaking down and are changing the environment of the sea, but also the effect of that erosion in terms of from a human geography point of view, you've got there, you've got a coastal town, you might have guest houses and hotels, but here we're thinking when we come back to health and well-being of leisure and tourism. So when we look at that picture, we can see all sorts of things. But we might also, when we think about time, look and consider what was there before. How has this changed? How could it change over time? So it's not about being fixed in this point, but it's about looking beyond that. And really, here's another example of that, because geography is about all the bits. It's about looking be beyond the human geography, thinking about here, why are these transport links here? Why have we got a, uh, why have we got a motorway there? Why have we got side roads in particular places? Why has that industrial estate to the left of this photo been built there? Why is the town in that particular place? And we're coming back to history here and we're thinking about how this has changed over time. We look at this particular snapshot of our lives, but this has developed over the last three, four hundred, three hundred years, four hundred years, and before that you've got a railway here. Uh, again, how long has that been there? Was that there before the roads? What are the clues? And again, it's about children asking the questions. And it's also thinking, is this the best use of the space? And what might this look like in the future? I don't have the answers to these. And as teachers, we shouldn't always have the answers. It's about helping the children to base their learning upon inquiry, about asking the questions, about thinking about the puzzles, but also what are the problems and how can we solve those? And again, geography is about looking at the spaces between the places. And when I say spaces, some of you will look at the map and think, well, I can see spaces there that, that could be filled in over time as our population grows, both within the UK and further afield. But for me, it's about those spaces refers to the gaps. What don't we know? What don't we know about what has happened over time? And how do we fill that in? Could we use maps? Could we use old maps? Coming back to history there. Uh, could we use documents? But yes is the answer. We can. But it's also helping the children to define those spaces for themselves. And sometimes you've got to start with the small picture and look at the fact that when we're thinking about the spaces, We've got to look at really close. You've almost got to crawl around on the floor with the magnifying glass looking at the ant. But then we'll look outwards and we'll start to look outwards. And when we looked at the previous slide there, what we did see was we saw physical geography. 
But now as we start to look outwards, we can see a bit more of the natural geography, but also human geography is creeping in as well. And let's go even bigger. Let's look at the even bigger picture. And here we have a part of history and a part of time that has only been around really for over just over a hundred years. The red arrows here flying over a Cornish coastline and the technology. You can bring technology in there. You can bring science. You've also, to a certain extent, got aspects of weather and things like that. But use the picture as a starting point. Get the children to ask questions. Just looking at a photo like that or standing in a particular environment, you will come up with more questions, as will the children, than you will the answers. But help the children to think about how they can develop their own answers and their own understanding and to be able to apply this for the benefit of themselves, of other humans, and most importantly, the environment and the nature that is, is found within it. And really, that involves going backwards, not backwards in time necessarily, although you can, because sometimes you've got the clues, but it's going in and looking at the smaller and smaller picture. And there, what we've got, going back to that smaller picture, is you've got the rocks, but you've got the rocks that are the foundation of geography. As far as we know, uh, the Earth has existed for 13.7 billion years. Some of these rocks that you're looking at here are anywhere up between 700 million and a billion years old. They could be even older. These rocks didn't necessarily start uh, their particular uh, or finish, if you like, their journey so far at this point in Cornwall. They may have been on the other side of the world. At some point, they will have been under the mantle of the earth. And again, these are stories. And th th this is fascinating stuff. Yes, it is. It's fascinating stuff. But your enthusiasm and your engagement with this subject is so key. It's so important. And again, it's a it's bringing them outwards and it's moving backwards and forwards, move backwards in time, move forwards in time. What could this be like in the future? And change the focus. Where are the children looking? Where do the children want to look? And what fascinates them the most? And use that as a basis for covering the conceptual and the contextual knowledge that is important in geography. And of course, all the time I've been talking about human in and environmental uh, interaction. And these are the big ideas. And when we're looking at and we're look, thinking about the big ideas carefully, but we're trying to understand them and we're trying to apply them, we have a means of, an, of identifying what it actually what actually thinking geographically looks like and what it feels like. And throughout this series of programmes, you'll hear me talking about time and talking about place and our beliefs, our beliefs of what the future should look like, what our environment should look like in the future, and our beliefs about the positive impact that we can have. But also, we need to learn the lessons from the past. What has gone wrong? What has actually gone wrong in the past? And how have we as humans had an influence on that? Because it's only by learning from the past, from the, the, the mistakes, if you like, but also the things that we and others have done well, that we can actually move forward to make a really positive difference to our own lives but also to the lives of the nature around us and for the survival of the planet as a whole. And 
this is where we really draw place and time together when we think about uh, the environment and the influence of the environment upon us and upon our survival so when we think about climate when we think about water our ability to uh, grow crops to grow food our changing of the environment in order to raise and support animals animals that we might use uh, as part of our diet but ultimately when we draw time and place together we're thinking about the future and how we can make uh, better decisions for the future and how to manage unforeseen circumstances in many a case we can we know what the what the consequences are going to be but we have to do something about it and when we approach this kind of thing with children yes they need to be aware of what is happening from a negative point of view but it's also about working together to provide positive action And these are some of the, the, the key influences of the humanities and what it means to uh, be human when, it, when we get out and about uh, with, with our learning. As, as I said right at the start, my research focuses upon inquiry based learning and upon outdoor learning. And as often as I can, I've got the children outside. Get, get them dressed appropriately, get a packed lunch, get the backpacks on, and let's get out and about and really enjoy what's around us. Children cannot learn that from being in the classroom, filling in worksheets, or looking at a map of the world. That's a part of it, but that's a part of it that comes from what they've been doing through inquiry-based learning asking their own questions and here we have uh, just coming back to the national curriculum in England remember that we do have the curriculum for excellence in Scotland there are other UK curriculums and more and more uh, we're thinking about successful models when it comes to curriculums around the world. So although we've got the national curriculum and the focus there, really it is about helping to develop a geography education that inspires a curiosity and fascination about the world, its people and the nature and the physical forces and looking at engaging the children and enthusing them long beyond what they learn within your classroom but let's look wider what's happening elsewhere in the world within schools and within education and let's bring that into our classroom as well let's not just focus upon the national curriculum for england but look at those models that we could use uh, within our own classrooms and beyond out and about within inquiry based learning. So, this is in geography, we're just thinking about the themes of time, place, and the beliefs we have about certain places, what we think we know, the stories we associate with different places. This is an ideal place <laughs> to bring children. Um, Settings have been used for the development of stories, whether about beliefs or uh, about the things that we associate with the place, not only now but in the past. So, as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm drawing all that together. Now, clearly, there are some that wouldn't be children here because of the worries that they have about health and safety and about risk assessments. But if children are used to coming to places like this and are used to your expectations of their behaviours and the do's and the don'ts, and clearly as long as you've got the right levels of uh, supervision in place, then <laughs> what you do is you, you do bring them to uh, locations and you do discuss things, but you also get the idea from the children of what it means to be here and we keep talking about 
mental and physical well-being. But you can rule that out. And sometimes you just give the children that chance to just sit and think and maybe talk and maybe record uh, in different ways. Maybe using video as I am doing, rural photographs, opportunity to bring the art side of things out of it. But there's also a huge amount of science as well as geography uh, and history and spirituality. No, clearly I, I've been out and about and that wasn't really the, the best of films. But what I did want to include there, uh, and hopefully you managed to hear, was the fact that sometimes as 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 teachers, we, we, we worry and we're, there's almost too much emphasis on health and safety and risk assessment. And clearly those are their key aspects. Uh, they're, they're not only legal aspects of being a teacher, but they are also moral aspects as well. But the more the children uh, have the opportunity to get out and about and explore uh, different locations, and you have high expectations of their behaviour and the do's and the don'ts, then you find it becomes easier. Your confidence as a teacher increases, but also the children love being outside so much and being engaged in what they see as practical, relevant learning, that you'll find that the behaviour managements you might have worried about, or certain aspects of the, uh, the physical environment that you might have worried about that could lead uh, to injury, they become less of a factor. When I was a, a teacher in the early stages of uh, uh, my, my career, I got the children outside as much as possible. And in the first three years of my teaching career, I, I set up a, a science and outdoor learning club. And we, we had over 100 children within that. But what we set up was we had 40 outdoor activities a year. And that meant they were getting out, they were visiting cliffs to go and watch uh, seabirds. They were involved in conservation activities where they were taking positive action using tools and different materials. Again, always under the right levels of supervision. And we were able to call upon parents to help support uh, with that level of supervision uh, and that kind of education. And over time, I became more and more confident with the range of activities that I could get the children 
uh, involved with. So it's only going to happen if you get the children outside and you get them looking and that you are confident, that you are enthusiastic. You're always mindful in terms of you're counting the number of children, uh, you're watching who's doing what, uh, you're always reminding them. But over time, you have to remind them less and less because they appreciate that to be outside is, is in some cases it's out of the ordinary and it's something that they enjoy and they want to do uh, more and more. Now, while I've been talking, hopefully you've read this slide. I'm not going to read that one to you, um, but it's about getting the children uh, engaged in practical, relevant learning uh, that enables them to collect uh, a whole range of data and helping them to analyze it, understand it and communicate it and communicate it in a range of ways. Yes, using maps, yes, using diagrams, getting online and using digital mapping, but also they might be taking photographs. They might be recording their own videos like I've done. And if you uh, show them some of the kind of videos that you've put together while you've been out on location, then it might inspire them to do the same. And again, all these different things to do with the national curriculum, other curricula are available and drawing those ideas in. So this is the key uh, content when it comes to uh, geography. And it's all tied together through these skills and field work. And National Geographic, uh, they have a wonderful website for children. It's called National Geographic uh, Kids, but it's helping children to understand where things are found, why they're there and how they develop uh, and change over time. And the skills, well, we can divide them into key stage one uh, and into key stage two. But all of these things, at the risk of repeating myself, all of these things are about practical, relevant learning. And you start to look within the school grounds, but you get out and about and you can develop a, a sense of a local patch that might be a part of the, the school grounds that has uh, has a whole range of natural opportunities and um, but there may also be a local patch within walking distance that you can actually visit you can map it you can see how it's changed over time but you can also look at time within shorter ranges so thinking about the seasons uh, and thinking about weather and thinking about how the climate might have changed things so giving the children an opportunity to appreciate that things change over time that they can see how it changes over the, maybe the course of a day over the course of a term and over uh, over the, a year and get the, the, give them the chance to be able to record that in a whole range of different ways. And just before we draw things to a close, as you can see here, <laughs> the picture on the right there <laughs> might be might be causing a few heart flutters, uh, might be causing a few looks of consternation. But again, if it's something the children are used to, get them outdoors, get them appreciating the high quality outdoor learning. And you've got a whole range of uh, pictures here. And these are things that I, I've done uh, and I, I have led uh, children uh, rambles through particular areas, looking, uh, looking for things out on the water in canoes and in boats. I've also led residential visits as well uh, under campus, under campus, under canvas, uh, but also uh, under under roofs as well. Youth hostels, residential outdoor education areas, and this is a link to this particular uh, document, which again might help to inspire you. And in the early stages of your teaching career. You, you're going to work with others. You're going to work with more experienced 
teachers, but have take the opportunities that are out there. It's not just about the teaching experience within the school, but look for experience elsewhere. You do have outdoor education centres, you've got castles where there's environmental and educational staff. Make the most of them. See what experience they've got, see how they can help you support, you be supported in your teaching. But equally and most importantly, how you can enhance the quality of the children's learning so they are infused and engaged with the humanities, with geography, with history, with this sense of belief about what the environment has been like in the past, but also what it looks like now, how they can influence it and how they can make a difference to the future through their own positive action. So thank you for being with us. Um, we'll see you next time for uh, program two. And let's leave you here and just say goodbye. And I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, it's time to go. Definitely time to go. Goodbye, everyone.